The Joker, one of, if not the most, recognizable fictional villain of all time. Everyone knows who the Joker is and what he's about. The clown prince of crime who terrorizes Gotham for his own amusement. He doesn't care about power or money like the other members of Batman's rogues gallery. He's chaos for chaos's sake, and as long as Gotham burns, he's having a good time. Pretty much every version of Batman's continuity includes the Joker, and I mean, it basically has to. The Joker is meant to reflect Bruce Wayne as another person who went through an extreme tragedy, but swung in the exact opposite direction. But I did say pretty much. Gotham was the longest running Batman live action show, running on Fox for five years. But Gotham is a little bit strange for a Batman show. As it turns out, Warner Brothers was perfectly okay with showrunner Bruno Heller making a long running Batman series for TV, but there was one small caveat. They weren't allowed to use the name Batman or the Joker. See, Warner Brothers is sorta of notorious for not respecting TV as a medium, and believes that film can tell a more intricate story. So despite Gotham being a full 100 hours in runtime, it's still not allowed to use two main Batman characters to tell its story. How did the show writers handle this little predicament? Well, you know how Batman stuff usually starts, his parents get shot in the alley, and then it jumps forward to either training to become Batman, or he's already Batman. Well, there's no jump in Gotham. Thomas and Martha Wayne get shot, and then the show's real protagonist walks in, Jim Gordon. That's all fine and dandy, but where does that leave us with the Joker? I mean, you can have Bruce as a kid for the entire story, but the Joker notoriously changes origin stories all of the time. Can Gotham even possibly have a Joker? The answer is yes. Two of them, actually. But also neither of them are officially the Joker. It's a quantum state of both Joker and not Joker. So today we're going to look into Gotham and the twin brothers Jerome and Jeremiah Valeska to see what the show's interpretation of the maybe Joker is, and see for ourselves how this wild story of Warner Brothers forbidding them from using the character, and all of the hoops they had to jump through to ignore them. Jerome Valeska is introduced in the latter half of season 1, when the show was sort of in a monster of the week format. The story of the episode is that someone from the carnival named Lila was murdered. The early lead suggests that it was a member of either the Flying Graysons, yes, those Flying Graysons, or from the Lloyd Clown family, as there was some sort of love triangle going on. Jerome, however, is the son of the victim, and for most of the runtime of the episode, he plays how sad he is about it, but near the end, it's uncovered that Jerome's famous sea captain father is not real, and his real father is a blind dude from the circus. Of course, Jerome was the real killer. We get a little taste of his Joker-like inspiration in the reveal that he's the killer, going from sobbing to laughing to creepypasta smile. In this episode, he reads a whole lot more more like a disturbed kid than the Joker, but you know, it's an origin story, so whatever. He does got the laugh down. <laughs> It's pretty unclear if they ever intended to use Jerome again after this single one-off story. It very easily could have just been its own thing, but his popularity spoke for itself. He then disappears into Arkham Asylum for a little while, until Barbara Keane eventually shows up there for killing her parents. Jerome apparently gained 60 charisma points, and he runs shit around here. Eventually, Jerome recruits Barbara into his little insane clown posse, and they pretty much just chill out here as normal people, talking about high school and shit. That's going pretty well until they're broken out of Arkham and introduced to Theo Galavan, who intends to make an evil group of super villains with no exact goal outside of making Gotham tremble, which already sounds a little sus, but they're lunatics, so they accept. They also announce themselves to the world by throwing a bunch of people off a building and spell out their little clan tag, maniacs, with an X at the end of it. Jerome does get the final word on this scene, but as of right now, he's just a member. In the next episode, Theo tells the team that they did some good villainy out there, and they've only just begun. After he leaves, Jerome and Robert Greenwood cannibal, get in a little argument about which one of them should be leader. What follows is one of the most captivating scenes in the entire show, where they play Russian roulette as a dick measuring contest, and Jerome, head case that he is, takes three shots at the start of the game. Okay, very cool. Jerome is now the leader of the Maniacs. Currently, outside of the laugh, he's not doing any real Joker shit, and I'm almost certain the Joker is not known for grouping up with people, but just hold on, we'll get there, I promise. The Maniacs, now led by Jerome, get up to some evil shenanigans, which is trying to burn a bus full of cheerleaders and then laying siege to the GCPD. It's here where we get a little dive into Jerome's actual motivations and his psyche. Jerome wants to spread the message to the civilians that the status quo is turning them into cogs in a machine, and he and his fellow clinically insane mass murderers are the ones who see clearly. You know the deal. He also kills Greenwood and the commissioner, but that one's off screen. I don't know why. He's still got the laugh. That's, that's great. You need the laugh. 
Next up on Jerome's things to do is sneaking into his blind dad's apartment and holding him hostage, recounting memories about how his mother and her many lovers repeatedly beat him and his birth father never helped. Having fully drank Theo Gallivan's Kool-Aid, Jerome intends to frame his father and also kill him. Before he does, his father tells him about how he's going to have a legacy of death and madness throughout Gotham. The fuzz does show up, but it's too late. The old guy dies. After this little patricidal mission, Jerome infiltrates the big old charity event for a children's hospital, disguised as a magician, with Barbara as his assistant, with some extremely convincing disguises, if I say so myself. He does some magic shit, including cutting Bruce Wayne in half, you know, like the magic way, not the gruesome way. After Bruce, he calls up some other important dude and just throws a knife into his chest. The gruesome way this time. All of the cronies start shooting the joint up, and Jim Gordon arrives on the scene. Jerome calls him on the phone and taunts him, and makes beyond ridiculous demands. Galavan stands up from the crowd with a totally not obviously rehearsed speech, and Barbara conks him on the head with a mallet. A bunch more shenanigans happen, and eventually Jerome gets bored and requests that Bruce come up to die for the crowd. Pretty fucking weird, because he had him on stage like three minutes ago and could have killed him, but fine. The scene ends with a standoff with Jim Gordon and Alfred while Jerome holds Bruce at knife point. Theo wakes up from being hit with a mallet and stabs Jerome in the neck, quietly admitting to betraying him. Jerome dies with a big old Joker smile on his face. All right, let's pause. It's time to get meta. At this point in the show's story, Jerome had his own little cult following that existed as like a subsection of the fan base, which is entirely fair. My first time watching, I was looking forward to the idea of Jerome and how he would take a primary antagonist role, but this cut it short. Of course, you have to remember, Warner Brothers told them they were absolutely not allowed to use the Joker, and Jerome was just a cheeky little way to have a Joker-like character in the plot, but they opted to not have him stick around to avoid going too far and having the plug pulled on them. After he dies, we hear his father's words about his legacy echo as people all around Gotham are influenced by him, doing random acts of violence and cackling while they do it. And this is what the writers had planned. The idea that Jerome was some sort of, like, religious figure who planted the seeds for all this chaotic nature, and whomever eventually became the official Joker would have just been copying him. I don't know, I think it's a pretty offensive idea to imagine that the Joker, one of fiction's most unique characters, was just a copycat of this guy he saw on TV killing people and laughing. Like, Jerome's charismatic and all, but I don't think he's enough to slowly corrupt everyone who watches him into the Joker. The writers, of course, realized that this was a really stupid idea, and they went back on it almost immediately. Despite not being an official appearance, at the end of Season 2, when all of the Indian Hill escapees get off the bus, including the Bruce Wayne clone, you can very clearly hear Jerome's laugh. Here, I'll play it for you. Obviously, this can't possibly be Jerome, as we know where his body is, and I highly doubt it's Jeremiah, because he's living life as a functional adult right now. It's possible that this was meant to serve as a teaser for a plotline where, along with Bruce, the Court of Owls cloned Jerome for some reason, but it never ended up going anywhere. Eventually, Jerome's body is taken to the GCPD, where he comes back to life and facelessly harasses Lee. Now, without his band of maniacs, he is in dire need of a new objective. He wanted to kill Bruce Wayne when he was dying, so, logically, he feels like killing Bruce Wayne again. Also, he's gonna find that face of his. Conveniently, that face of his is on the first channel he sees when he turns on the television, so he heads off in a police cosplay to retrieve it. He kidnaps the cult leader who was wearing his face and takes it back for himself, stapling it on. Which is something that actually did happen to the real Joker in the New 52 comics as well. After retrieving his face, he gives a TV address about how he's gonna blow up the power plant or something, and that's fine, but holy moly did Cameron decide to take Jerome in a different direction after the revival. Previously, Jerome was sort of like a manic kid that was kind of Jokerish. But after being revived, the performance is very clearly Heath Ledger inspired. Here, I'll play three lines to show you what I mean. Now that's a headline. <laughs> Do what you want, kill who you want. Mm. I mean, what happened? Did your, your balls drop off? Hmm? Yeah. So I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Ledger's Joker is the best there ever was for a lot of people. I'm just saying that it's clearly there. Anyway, in the interest of keeping this concise, Jerome somehow finds his cult after blowing up the plant and goes to kidnap Bruce. Bruce convinces him that killing him privately in his house isn't very showy, and despite knowing that he's being played, Jerome agrees. Jerome then takes Bruce to a carnival and just fucks with him for a little while, making fun of his ideology and putting homeless clan blood on his face and shit. Just all around weird psychopath behavior. When he eventually gets bored of pushing his beliefs on Bruce, he decides to fire shrapnel out of a cannon at him in front of an audience, but unfortunately, Alfred and Gordon 
show up and save the day, etc., etc. Jerome bails and Bruce chases him to a hall of mirrors and they duke it out like men. Bruce wins and Jerome's face gets all slidey and it's really gross. But here's a few things that's very interesting from a meta perspective again. According to Cameron Monaghan, Jerome was supposed to die in this episode, specifically by beheading. But the writers had decided they wanted him to mean something more important to the Joker's story, which I think implies that they had figured out how they were going to transition in the next season. So Gordon punches Jerome's face off and he's sent off to Arkham, which absolutely nobody escapes from, ever. It's about this time in the show where you fall into one of two camps. Either you thought Jerome was the greatest thing ever and he's carrying the show on his back by himself, or you thought he was a cheesy knockoff Joker. Personally, as he started to develop, I just adopted the headcanon that he was the Joker and ignored all the boardroom politics that led to him not being allowed to be called the Joker. And I'm pretty glad they kept Cameron on board. However, once we jump into season four, the grand plan for the Joker's origin becomes a little more clear. So just like season three, Jerome doesn't show up until about the halfway point, which is conveniently right Right when the ratings started to dip. He spent some time in Arkham fucking with the Penguin just for fun, and that's a dandy time. During the course of this, we learn that Jerome pretty much has the entirety of Arkham, inmate, and staff under his control, which is pretty well in line with how the Joker operates in the comics. A little bit later on, Jerome executes his breakout of Arkham, and it's probably my favorite scene in the show, featuring a trio team up of Jerome, the Mad Hatter, and the Scarecrow. All three of them are a great representation of the characters, and they feel very charismatic. Honestly, my favorite part of the scene is just when they're exiting. Arkham, and I know this is a Joker video, but I probably won't get another chance to talk about this, so here I go. Just look at how all three of the characters walk. The Hatter is refined and classy. Jerome does his best to make a show of it while entertaining his self-proclaimed cronies, but for some reason my favorite has always been Scarecrow. It's super low-key, but the way he walks just almost personifies fear. It's incredibly imposing. It's insane to me that these actors can exude that much personality in just how they choose to walk, and it's even crazier that I care this much. After escaping, Jerome's plan is pretty much threaten his uncle into giving him the location of some unknown person. That plan goes awry, but Bruce shows up to save him, and and he gets the location he wanted and bounces. The terrible trio then go to recruit a few more homies, namely Penguin, Mr. Freeze, and Firefly. Jerome mentions that he has Scarecrow working on a special project, which is really going to help his whole Joker thing. Jerome goes looking for the Xander guy at the job he was told about, but they only ever communicate with him via proxy, and they give up her location. So unfortunately, Jerome's wild goose chase continues. Jerome encounters the not Harley Quinn proxy and gets kidnapped and taken to Xander Wild, who is actually Jerome's secret twin brother. Jeremiah Valeska. Now as far as I'm concerned, the comic book version of the Joker does not have any siblings that I'm aware of, but the writers of the show have a plan. Jeremiah, unlike his brother, is mentally stable. Kind of meek, actually. As his story goes, Jerome tortured him for his entire life, so he ran from the circus in fear. As Jerome's story goes, that shit ain't true, and he just wanted to leave the circus. And Jeremiah's lies resulted in him being beaten and ostracized by everyone. During this conversation, Jerome also says the Joker line. We all could go insane with just one bad day. The 5-0 show up, but Jerome escapes with the aid of Tetch and Crane, promising to come back for his brother eventually and drive him mad. Jeremiah ends up being like a pretty normal and helpful dude, and bonds with Jim and Bruce, and he also made these Miracle of Science batteries that can power entire sections of Gotham and don't burn fossil fuels. Okay, so bad news, Jerome did not get his brother. Good news, Scarecrow has finished his work on that secret project, and what do you know, it's a gas that makes people laugh until they split their faces open. I don't know, the point is that they die. It's another trademark Joker weapon. With this new weapon, the League of Horribles and Jerome kidnap a bunch of important people and hold them hostage on a stage. During this scene, we also get to see a genius piece of technology that should be in a whole lot more media. Jerome holds a detonator for a bomb strapped around each of the hostages' necks. But there is an innovative part here, the dead man's trigger. Should Jerome's hand stop gripping the detonator for any reason, the bombs will detonate and pop their heads off like dandelions. There's also two additional seats for Bruce and Jeremiah, both of whom come willingly with a bomb jammer hidden in their pockets. But Jerome has a plan B, a big old blimp with the laughing gas in it. Blah blah, Penguin is on the blimp and he saves the day. And this is the episode where Jerome meets his end. Jim Gordon tries to save him, but he falls to his death of his own free will, and the scene mimics Jack Nicholson's death in Batman 89. Alright, so what's going on? Jerome was born in a time where the writers were scared to make him the Joker. They got more and more daring as time went on with how close to the sun they would fly, but he could just never fully be the Joker. They needed a new character to fill the role, one with intent. So after Jerome's death, he left a jack-in-the-box for his brother with a special, intentionally designed mix of Scarecrow's toxin. Jeremiah starts to cackle, and we hear a speech very similar to the one Jerome received from his father, about him becoming Jerome's ultimate revenge on Gotham. Now, I think it would be a little silly 
to have Jeremiah just be a reflection of Jerome. In all versions of the Joker, there's a few key themes that carry through them, but they can vary wildly. I've watched a shitload of Batman media in preparation for this video, including a pretty bad four hour long movie just to see Jared Leto talk about giving Batman a reach around. Jerome in his time reflected the aspect of pure chaos. Even when he had the motivation of taking revenge on his brother, he did it mostly for entertainment's sake. His philosophy is what carried him, and that's why people loved him. Jeremiah, on the other hand, is a completely different beast. Let's take a look at how they took the same actor to be the same character and had it be nothing alike. Jeremiah, even being hit with the gas, continues his friendship with Bruce and their project to make the miracle battery things. However, Arkham gave all of Jerome's belongings to Jeremiah, including this weird manifesto thing, which Bruce thinks is corrupting his mind. Jeremiah expresses that Jerome failed everything he did because he had no shred of sanity, which is the first hint the show will give towards the direction they intend to take Jeremiah. Postmortem Jerome, it's actually Jeremiah in disguise, has his cronies do some nonsense and then the real Jeremiah freaks the fuck out that Jerome is still alive. Bruce, incredibly sane and logical individual, decides that they need to go dig Jerome's body up to prove that he's dead. Yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense, Bruce. Let's go. Whoops, the grave is dug up already and now Jeremiah is vindicated in his insane paranoia. A bunch of bullshit happens. Jeremiah thinks Bruce is Jerome wearing his face, which is really dumb because there's like a height difference of over a foot and wearing the whole face thing doesn't look surgical if I remember correctly. Anyway, he takes Bruce back to Jerome's grave to bury him there, but Jerome's body is back, and then eventually the penny drops that this was all an elaborate plan by Jeremiah for some reason. Yeah, I don't really know what the plan was. I mean, I guess Jim Gordon got trapped in a compound, but I have no clue why he fucked with Bruce in the graveyard. He gives some speech to Jerome's ex-followers about how his brother was a lunatic and inferior to him. He continues to explain that he embodies true sanity, which is actually also in line with a lot of stories centering on the Joker. One channel on YouTube I've been following for a very long time, The Imaginary Axis, did a video trying to diagnose the Joker. It's a really good video and you should definitely check it out, but in short, the Joker has never been classified as any specific breed of insane. He's just clearly not what we would call sane. So the theory of the video reasons that he's a level above normal sanity, or super sane, and I think that's the aspect of the Joker that Jeremiah is built upon. Jeremiah expresses that he absolutely does not want to kill Bruce, as he sees himself as sort of a reflection of Bruce, and his main goal seems to be wanting to be close to him, but like in an evil kind of way. He also found a way to turn his miracle generator into bombs and kills James Gordon, except not really. Now in the scene that really birthed Jeremiah, he explains to the GCP that he intends to level the city so he can make a new city. He expresses his goals and his intentions extremely calmly and eloquently, a stark contrast to his brother. He also gives the police and government time to evacuate all the citizens, albeit it's not enough time, but he gives them some time. Gordon, surviving the explosion, pretty much unravels Jeremiah's control over his goons, and then Harvey and Lucius defuse the rest of his bombs and he's back to square one. Ra's al Ghul appears and they do some villain team-up stuff and that's pretty cool, but what's really interesting is how Jeremiah remains dedicated. Quickly and calmly reasoning out what went wrong with his plan before simply stating, I'll need to start again. Then he stabs Selena Kyle and gets arrested. He uses the threat of more bombs to get to talk to Bruce in an interrogation scene that is very reminiscent of the Dark Knight. Please take note that this is not exactly green hair and that's not exactly a purple suit because he's still not allowed to have that drip. In the climax of season 4, he gets slapped around a little and Raish blows up some bridges and severs Gotham's connection to the outside world. Jeremiah disappears for a little while after the bridges blow up and then eventually he he's running a cult, including the boys who are digging a tunnel from Gotham to the mainland. His assistant back from when he was normal is Harley Quinn, but like in the same way that Jeremiah is the Joker. Anyway, what's important is that in this season, Cameron has decided to adopt a new manner of speech. While Jeremiah was previously just a normal, serious sounding guy, he now speaks with a little flair, leaning even harder into the Joker. Things seem to be going great for him until Selina stabs him. A lot. Like, a lot, a lot. He survives because he is a comic book character, but I guess being repeatedly stabbed was part of his plan anyway. His plan involves making two people look identical to Bruce's parents via surgery, I guess. Weirdly, for like a few episodes, Jeremiah gets a backseat after that. I'm assuming because this was a half season compared to the others, they had to seriously cut down on one of their storylines. And since Gotham was already in ruin, Jeremiah becoming the Joker was less important than No Man's Land and the birth of Batman. He gets like 50 seconds at the end of episode 5 and 6, 
Olympics. But in those 50 seconds, we see Jeremiah kidnap Alfred. Despite being shafted by the last few episodes, Jeremiah does get a lot of screen time in episode 7. And that's fitting because this is the last time we'll see him before the time skip finale. Bruce arrives home to see his fucking parents, which is obviously not a very expected situation. And Alfred is playing along with it. Jeremiah has them all hypnotized by Tetch, who somehow stayed underground until this exact day during No Man's Land, but anyway. Jeremiah's master plan is to kill the fake Waynes to relive the day with Bruce so they can be even more bonded. Is this a romantic thing? Bruce doesn't give a fuck about the fakes, so Jeremiah replaces them with Jim and Lee. Selena intervenes, which is a huge character moment because she didn't intervene the first time because she was a nine-year-old street rat or whatever. Jeremiah has a backup plan, which is blow shit up and run away. He runs away to Ace Chemicals, the location most tied to the Joker between every remade origin story. Most notably in The Killing Joke, and it's almost universally considered to be the single most concrete through line we have to the Joker. However, I think it's important to note that the Joker Joker is often said to have gotten the cosmetic effects of white skin, red lips, and green hair from the chemicals, as well as having them dement his mind. Jeremiah already had all that shit wrong with him, so this is just like normal acid. Kinda weak acid though, it just kinda like fucks him up aesthetically. Also he uses it as an opportunity to play brain dead for the entire time skip, and after the time skip, I'm not sure what happened. I guess they just decided to go full send on the whole Joker thing, hell with the consequences, because in the last episode they were gonna make it count. I'm talking purple jacket, green suit, yellow gloves, even the tie. But you know, he ain't got no hair, so they avoided the green hair issue at least. Even Echo is in a real Harley Quinn outfit, but she dies, so I guess she was to Harley what Jerome was to the Joker. During the climax, when Gordon calls him Jeremiah, he shirks the name and suggests another, all starting with J, but they still refuse to say the Joker. The most interesting thing about this scene is that when Batman shows up to save the day, Jeremiah recognizes him and even lowers his gun for a second, which leads me to believe that the part of Jeremiah's brotherly love about Bruce isn't just a show. And with that episode, that wraps up everything that the two fill-in Jokers did over the entire five years that Gotham was on air. But the big question, and the reason we're all here, are the Valeska twins the Joker? Yes, I think it's pretty obvious that they are both the Joker. Hell, even the head writer called him the Joker on three separate occasions on Twitter. This isn't to say that every version of the Joker from every universe needed to have a twin brother that did the same thing before them. But this is a DC show, and in the DC universe, there's a ton of alternate bubble universes. There's even one where every Everyone is vampires. So it isn't so far-fetched to believe that in one of those many, many bubble universes, the Joker was actually a pair of twins who were both insane in two entirely different ways. Denying these two characters, and more importantly, denying Cameron Monaghan the honor of the name, only has a singular basis of the fact that they weren't allowed to dress him correctly or use the name in the show, but that's leaning on a real-life issue to wash away an in-universe plot point, and it doesn't feel very right. Cameron manages to not only play one, but two fantastic live action Jokers. He's not exactly on Ledger or Nicholson's level, but they're still incredible and this version of the character expertly matches this version of Gotham City. They're definitely above Jared Leto and depending on your taste, they're above, what's that other guy's name? I can't remember. And there you have it, how a TV show that was held down by a corporate board managed to bend the rules just enough to sneak the most iconic villain of Batman's rogues gallery past the red tape. Not once, but twice, and pretty damn well. Almost every character in Gotham is among the best they've ever been displayed, and I could easily make full-length videos about Oswald Cobblepot or Ed Nigma if I wanted to as well. This show seems to have a way of just slow burning these villain origins that can't really be matched by a movie. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Gotham is a fantastic show, and I highly recommend it to anyone who's a fan of Batman. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like and maybe subscribe, and thanks for watching.